Uh, thank you, Lydia, for the wonderful introduction. Um, I do need to update it to where it says Historic Tuscaloosa instead of Tuscaloosa County Preservation Society. So if you haven't heard, we recently had a name change uh, and changed our name to Historic Tuscaloosa to sort of update us and bring us into the, uh, the 21st century. Plus, all of our emails and uh, social medias and uh, web addresses all have Historic Tuscaloosa in it, so it just made good sense. Uh, I am the director. Uh, we received the five historic structures here in Tuscaloosa and sort of serve as uh, the local historic, uh, local historian for uh, the city and county. I get questions, phone calls, emails just about every day asking about some sort of aspects uh, about uh, the history of Tuscaloosa. Uh, we entertain lots of school groups, civic groups, uh, and other organizations that uh, come through the homes to learn more about our local history. Uh, these groups of people, these garden groups, are some of my favorite groups because y'all come and help us decorate each year uh, for Christmas and make us look absolutely fantastic when it's actually... So uh, a little bit about uh, Historic Tuscaloosa. We were founded in 1966. Uh, the founding took place uh, when concerned uh, Tuscaloosa residents wanted to save the old tavern. Uh, if you didn't know, it originally was located right at the foot of the bridge that connects Tuscaloosa and Northport. Uh, in order to make way for the new bridge, they had to pick up the old tavern and move it to Capitol Park. Uh, so uh, Annie Ross D gathered some of her friends together and said, hey, we really need to save this building. Let's do it. So they got school kids to bring in pennies, nickels, dimes, all their loose change. Uh, got civic groups uh, organized and involved and were able to actually pick up the tavern uh, and move it to its current location at Capitol Park. Uh, once that was done, they were sort of sitting around and they said, well, I guess we just formed the Tuscaloosa County uh, Preservation Society. So we've been around since, uh, ever since then, since 1966. Now that wasn't the only home that we picked up and moved. Uh, we also moved the McGuire Strickland House, which sits at Capitol Park as well. Its original location was right next door on the corner of 15th and Greensboro Avenue, uh, where Wells Fargo Bank now sits today. We moved it to Capitol Park uh, in the 1970s in order to save it, and it's actually the oldest wooden structure left in Tuscaloosa. Uh, it now serves as uh, a school building for the Capitol School, which is a Montessori school run by Dr. Uh, Barbara Roundtree. Uh, if that building is not open for tours, for some reason Dr. Roundtree doesn't like it when I bring strangers into her school. I don't know why we would have a problem with that, but whatever. Uh, but you can still go see the exterior of it. Uh, when you go to Capitol Park and visit the tavern and the ruins there. Uh, the other, one of the other structures that we are in charge of is the Murky Collins House. Uh, it was owned by uh, the first African American mortuary in Tuscaloosa. Uh, it sort of sat at the head of what was then called Lace Way. Uh, all, uh, all of the homes right down that street all had lace curtains in the windows. Uh, and it was essentially the uh, aristocratic African American portion of Tuscaloosa at the time. Uh, they got the nick nickname of Lace Way. Unfortunately, that's the only house to survive uh, from that time period. Uh, rumor has it and legend has it that some of the uh, bricks and stone from the Capitol when it burned in the 1920s are interwoven into the construction of the Murphy Collins House. Because once the Capitol burned, local contractors went and reused bricks and that sort of thing from the uh, ruins and put them into their current constructions. Uh, we don't have any providential evidence that that actually happened in that particular house, but that's the story that comes along with it. And we'll roll with it because it's a pretty neat story if you ask me. Uh, so that uh, house now houses the uh, Murphy African American Museum. Uh, it will be reopened on Veterans Day coming up here soon. Uh, it's been closed for the, for the summer months as we received uh, funding from the city and other couple of uh, organizations to redo a massive restoration on the interior of the home. Uh, so we couldn't have it open and having guests going through while construction and dust and everything else was happening. So that reopens um, in, on the Veterans Day. If you have not been to the African American Museum, you should really go and check it out. Some really interesting artifacts, some really interesting history in there that I didn't even know uh, was in there. Like I didn't know an African American invented what we all call the cowboy saddle that goes on the back of a horse. The next home uh, that we're in charge of is the Battle Freeman House and Gardens. Uh, it was built in two stages. The first uh, portion of the front portion of the house was built by Alfred Battle as a weekend townhome. 
uh, in the 1830s. Then he decided he wanted to move into town full time and his wife said that's cool and everything, but you're gonna have to put an addition on the house because it's not large enough. I don't know any ladies here that would ever make that demand of their husbands today. <laughs> Mine would. <laughs> So they added on to the house and moved into, into, into Tuscaloosa full-time in 1844. Uh, their full-time residence was uh, a plantation out located around where Moundville is today. Uh, they lived in that particular residence up until the 1870s in Reconstruction when they were unable to afford uh, both homes at the time. So they then sold it to Bernard Friedman, who was the uh, second person to own the home. Uh, it stayed in the Friedman family up until about 1966 when Hugo Friedman passed away uh, and left the building to the city of Tuscaloosa. We now take care of that building for the city of Tuscaloosa to keep it up and running uh, as prescribed by the last will and testament of Hugo Friedman. Uh, Hugo Friedman may sound familiar because he actually purchased this home at one point, donated it to the city of Tuscaloosa, and turned it into the uh, Friedman Public Library. Uh, this building remained a public library until the new building, which was built in the 1970s, was opened up down on what was then called River Road, now Jack Warner Parkway. Who still rides around Tuscaloosa and calls it River Road? I do. <laughs> Who remembers coming to the library? <coughs> I don't remember, but I was told I was brought here when it was the library. Just, just, just a little enough for that. All right. So the uh, Battle Freeman Home is open for public tours as well. We do those Tuesday through Saturday. Uh, at 2.30, always check our social media or uh, give, us, give us a call in the office to make sure we're doing tours that day because when we have events such as this, we can't be in three or four places at once. We have to be at the event. So we typically close when we have um, events. Uh, the Battle Freeman House um, is unique uh, in that uh, it was only owned by two families uh, for its entire existence. Most homes of its age typically go through a handful of different families, but being just the Battle family and just the Friedman family uh, really makes it unique uh, in that it was only owned by two families. Uh, the Fern House, this, I thought y'all might think of this, the Fern House that's located on the grounds of, uh, of the Battle Friedman House is one of the oldest surviving Fern Houses, not only in the state of Alabama, but in the Southeast as well. So we take a lot of pride in actually having one of those uh, still standing and taken care of. It received a new roof just a few years ago, so we will have many more years of uh, enjoy, enjoying it um, as well. Uh, so we're now, so obviously we're sitting in the Jemison Vandegraaff Mansion. Uh, this home was built by Senator Robert Jemison between 1859 and 1862 as his weekend townhome. Twice as much building this house as the state of Alabama did build in the state capitol. Wow. Bear in mind, the senator owned almost all of the construction materials, owned all of the construction labor, and basically just had to pay for the finer paints and wallpapers and that sort of thing. And glass. And, yeah, and glass. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad for a weekend town. Though. <laughs> so his, his full-time residence was uh, just on the other side of the river, right where about the airport is located today. Uh, that home is long gone. It burned to the ground many, many years ago, uh, sort of near where uh, Vandegraaff Park is located today in Vandegraaff uh, Cemetery. Uh, so he built this home uh, essentially for two reasons, to show off how wealthy he was uh, and to get his daughter married. And I think he succeeded in both, uh, both enterprises. Um, it was the most technologically advanced home in the state of Alabama when it was completed. Uh, it was the first home to be fully lit with gas lighting had the first fully functional indoor bathroom inside the house, and it was supposed to have central heating, but he couldn't get his boiler through the blockade. So, <laughs> but he did get three sets of French glass through the blockade, because the first set arrived, and he didn't like it. He said, it's not French, send it back. So they sent it back. I mean, it's not like, you know, FedEx today, where you just throw it on an airplane and ship it right back across. So they had to make the glass, they made the glass in Paris, France, Floated it down the Seine, across the Atlantic, through the Caribbean, watch out for hurricanes and pirates because that was still a thing, uh, up through the port of Mobile, from Mobile to Selma by train, and from Selma to Tuscaloosa in the back of a wagon drawn by a bunch of mules. He sent two sets of glass back. Finally, the third set of glass arrives, and it's 1861. We got a small little civil war going on, and I'm sitting here thinking, 
in 2022. You know, a couple of guns might have been more helpful than a set of glass. But yeah, that's, that's my thought process. Um, so the other major uh, thing that he shipped in from Paris, France, is the wallpaper that lines both of these two parlors that we're sitting in today. Now, all of the colors in the home are the original colors to the home. It, it was redone during the restoration process in the mid-1990s. They're exactly the same colors. They did chemical bore analysis inside of all the walls to find the first color of paint. Take that down to the local Lowe's or Home Depot and say, hey, I need this color. They match it up, voila. Well, except that happened except for these two rooms. These two rooms were originally covered in 100% raw silk wallpaper. I'm not done yet, hold on. <laughs> With a 24 karat gold inlay. Oh, wow. I know that's the best part. <laughs> there it is. So that was uh, a little bit out of a nonprofit's budget. Uh, they contacted the company in Paris, France that originally produced it. Uh, and they said, yes, we can still reproduce that for you, no problem. Next question, how much is it? $400 a square foot in 1995. <laughs> Multiply that out by all of the walls in these two parlors and you can see why that might be a little out of budget. So they purchased two square feet, had it shipped over uh, and matched it as closely as possible with the wallpaper they found here locally. And then the artisans that painted the rest of the house said, oh, no problem, we'll just stencil on the same pattern. So this gives us a good idea of what it would have looked like, but not quite as shimmery and shiny as it, as it would have originally been. Now that's one of the favorite, my favorite aspects about this particular house. Um, all of the wonderful wood trim that you'll see throughout the home is actually concrete painted to look like wood. Yes. Um, so one of the most common questions is, so how does the senator amass such wealth? Well, that's a very good question. Not only did he have his Tuscaloosa slash Northport plantation, he had five other plantations in West Alabama, built toll roads and toll bridges and collected said tolls, had a lumber mill in Mississippi, was invested in steamships, railroads, uh, and just about every other thing you can shake a stick at, and was the largest coal field owner in the state of Alabama. He was also a politician, so I'm sure everything that he did was absolutely above the table, and not one dirty deed was done underneath it. I can not guarantee that at all, but uh, he looks like a trusting guy. Uh, so, that, so that's how he uh, uh, amassed uh, his wealth. He was one of the wealthiest, if not uh, the wealthiest man in the state of Alabama prior to the outbreak of the war. Uh, he was a staunch Unionist, uh, and he did not believe that the Confederacy should have um, succeeded from the Union, uh, and was one of Tuscaloosa's two representatives to Montgomery for the secession vote. Tuscaloosa voted to stay loyal to the Union prior to the outbreak of the Civil War. Obviously, he lost that argument in uh, Montgomery, uh, and once the vote was taken, he then threw his weight, both literally and figuratively, uh, behind uh, his new country and the Confederacy. He served in the Alabama House and the Alabama Senate, had eyes on becoming the governor of Alabama, but that pesky little civil war got the way. Uh, so uh, he stayed as president of the Alabama Senate at the time. Once William Yancey suddenly passed away, uh, he was then appointed to serve out the remainder of his term in Richmond as a Confederate <coughs> Senator. Uh, the surrender of Tuscaloosa actually took place on the front porch of this particular home. The Jemisons were hosting a wedding reception that evening for a Confederate officer. And since this was the only home in the city and state that had gas lighting, when Croxton and his Raiders got finished playing with the cadets from the University of Alabama, they looked up and said, oh, I'm going there. <laughs> so Croxton comes riding down Greensboro Avenue. Uh, and some little boys are out in front going, the Yankees are coming, the Yankees are coming. And there's been a couple of false alarms before this. So I'm sure a dad sticks his head out the front door and says, oh Lord, they are coming. <laughs> so the uh, senator and a couple of other high ranking officials go run out the back door of the kitchen and they go hide in the swamp where 15th Street is today. The mayor of the city of Tuscaloosa meets General Croxton at the front door of the house, immediately surrenders the city of Tuscaloosa, gladly reminds him that we voted to stay loyal to the union. We took care of our POWs as best we could and said, oh, by the way, the university is that way. Because <laughs> the university was essentially West Point of the South. It was a military uh, cadet school. Croxton leaves here, goes and burns the university to the ground and leaves the city of Tuscaloosa standing. This all happens two days before Lee surrenders at Appomattox. So that's how Tuscaloosa's downtown survived 
the end of the Civil War. Crossing and his raiders burned the University of Alabama to the ground, minus four buildings. Uh, so the President's Mansion survived, the Gorgas House survived, uh, the little round house which housed all of the military gear for the cadets survived. I don't know how that wasn't at the top of the list to burn because I was going, oh, burn all their stuff first. The uh, astronomy building survived uh, and, along the President's Mansion. So the, uh, General Garland and his wife had fled from the President's Mansion to Bryce Hospital when the Yankees were coming. Uh, Dr. Bryce had grabbed a patient and painted uh, red polka dots onto him and put him in a carriage, rode out to meet the Yankees, and said, we've got smallpox, you don't want to come over here, and the Yankees go, okay. So he saved Bryce Hospital by doing that. Well, while that was going on, Mrs. Garland was watching everything unfold from the rotunda at Bryce Hospital. She then forced one of the slaves to take her back to the president's mansion where uh, she saved the president's mansion. Now that we all know actually happened. Here's where rumors, innuendos, and lack of facts and provenance comes into play. So the story goes, uh, the Confed uh, Union troops had either piled all of the furniture up into the foyer of the home or right outside on the front lawn of the home and were just about to set it on fire. She gets there. And I'm pretty sure it was not a nice southerly <laughs> lady that talked to those troops. I'm pretty sure she threw the hissy fits of all hissy fits a mama had ever thrown in her entire life. And I'm going to drag you out to this grocery store and I'm going to give you something to cry about. Lecture to them little Yankee soldiers. Regardless of the fact, she ended up saving uh, the president's mansion. And we don't know if she had the soldiers put all of the furniture back where it was or if that happened at a later date. We just don't know. The next great part of the story is it's then said that she proceeded to serve the soldiers lemonade and cookies for uh, not burning the house to the ground. She went back to her southern. Then she went back to nice mama. Mama never did anything like that on the back of the house. That essentially was uh, an attached greenhouse to the home. So instead of having a fern house, they had a conservatory built, on, built onto the home. Now, it was not common, but it was also uncommon as well. Lots of folks had fern houses and greenhouses, but very few people, especially in the South, had a conservatory built on connecting to the house. So that was another way for him to show off how wealthy he was. Now, but ours is different in that it's two levels of a greenhouse instead of just one level. And that's where they would keep lots of flowering tropical plants uh, to be grown throughout the year, which would have helped with the smell of the house. So you could always have fresh flowers cut uh, and displayed somewhere in the house. Lots of fresh fruits, lemons, limes, uh, apples, that sort of thing. Anything with a flowery type of fruit was probably grown in there as well. Now the windows in the ladies' parlor uh, open up into the conservatory. So in the summer months, you could open up those windows and all the wonderful smells from the conservatory would then wave into the ladies' parlor to help with the smell of the house. That was necessary because all of the transportation left little reminders about them up and down the streets, which I'm sure smell fantastic uh, year round, especially in the warm summer months that we're so known for here in Alabama. Because uh, fortunately, most of the Jemison's papers are housed uh, at the university in special collections. So we do know that she saved the president's mansion. Once she got there, we don't know the exact details except for stories and legends that have been passed down. It is not true, no. Uh, so downstairs in the basement, we have a cooling well that's located down there. Essentially, it's a 30-some-odd-foot hole in the ground that served as a refrigerator. It stays about 42 degrees year-round, about the same temperature as our modern refrigerators today, and that's where you could store things uh, that you wanted to keep cool or make them last longer. So like your milk, your eggs, all of that sort of thing. Uh, Operate on a pulley system, so you pulley it up, take off what you need, and lower it back down. But pretty sure that's where the rumor originated. Also, do end up, or used to end up, in the river. Those aren't connected to the house. Okay. It's basically old waste walk street runoff tunnels. Uh, and the reason why that happens is the building that used to house all the public works records burned at some point, and all of those wonderful maps were lost. So when Aldot was recently <laughs> doing Lurling Wallace, it took forever because we kept running across this pipe. Oh, we don't know what that is. Let's get the gas company out here. Well, it's not gas. Well, let's get this. And so 
it took them forever to complete the project simply because they didn't have any maps to know where the really, really old stuff was. Yes, ma'am? Politics. <laughs> that's the short answer to the question. That's part, that's part of the answer, yes, all right. So uh, we were the state capital from 1826 until 1846. Our capital moved from Old Cahaba to Tuscaloosa, from Tuscaloosa to Montgomery. Uh, so it moved to Montgomery uh, because allegedly it's more centrally located, uh, but it was connected to uh, the two main transportations at the time, with the river system and railroads. At the time, Tuscaloosa did not have a railroad that ran to it. Uh, and so those are the two main reasons it was done. Also, also a couple of really wealthy planters and politically important people wanted the capital closer to home. 